It's a great morning to be at church. Well, hey, if you are new or a first-time visitor or a guest here for the very first time, we want to welcome you. Thank you. You picked the right place to be this morning. Uh, we want to welcome you to Harvest. Just do us one favor while you're here. You can fill out an Omnu card in the seat back in front of you or behind you. Um, Fill that out, hand it to our hospitality team, uh, and you'll receive a free bag of gourmet popcorn. And also, you'll get a, an email from Pastor Jason this week welcoming you for, to Harvest and thanking you for joining us this week. Man, well, we have a lot of things going on, and that is that is a sign of a, of a forward-moving church, right? Is when we have a lot of things going on. And so, hey, listen, tonight, if you're looking to get plugged into Harvest, and you say, man, I want to help out, but I'm not sure where I, where I fit in or, or what all's going on, on tonight is a night where you can learn all about that. Um, we want to invite you, Pastor Jason, myself, and Pastor Jason will be teaching a three part class tonight called Growth Track. 5 p.m. right here upstairs, room 205. Uh, child care is provided, so come and join us. Uh, it's a three part class. You'll learn the history of Harvest, uh, a lot of things that we're doing around here, some history of why we're doing the things we're doing, and also. So uh, we'll take a personality test and a spiritual gifts test and find out exactly where you fit best here at Harvest. So come hang out with us for a little while. It's going to be fun. We are super excited. Where's all the ladies in the house this morning? All right. Hey, have you guys signed up for a women's um, uh, conference at Copper Point Church? Pastor Lisa has taken a group of girls um, to, to uh, Copper Point. Um, it is October 20th through the 22nd. Um, and guest speakers are Charlotte Gamble, uh, Julia Veach, and Kay Woodward. If you guys haven't heard any of them speak before, they are all phenomenal speakers. So ladies, make sure you sign up at the information table for that on the sign-up sheet so Pastor Lisa can have a better idea of who's all going on that. Also, our... Um, we are getting closer to our trunk or treat, uh, and we are getting candy. Um, uh, you see our candy barrels out in the foyer, so if you're at Sam's Club or Costco or Walmart and see bags of candy on sale, please pick those up, drop them off in the, in the, uh, in the barrels, and we're super excited about trunk or treat coming up October 31st. So, hey, are you guys ready for a great morning this morning? Praise God. Well, hey, how are y'all doing? Good morning. Yeah. Can we just get a good, like, unified woo going? Woo! Yeah! Woo! Oh. Man, I think church should have, like, a ton of energy and be super exciting and have Jose yelling the entire time. Uh, this morning, uh, for, for our tithes and offering, I wanted to talk about how, how, um, the church's giving helped change my life. Um, I did not, I was not raised in the church even a little bit. Um, we went to church maybe twice a year. So 50 uh, weeks out of the year, I was sleeping in because uh, Sundays there aren't Saturday morning cartoons, which we learned a couple weeks ago how much I love Saturday morning cartoons. Um, and so I finally got invited to church for the first time uh, in eighth grade. And when I was asked, my buddy was like, hey, come to church with me because he was a good teenage Christian and that's the only way he knew how to invite somebody to church. Hey, come to church with him. And immediately my thoughts go to, I'm going to have to sit in a pew. I'm going to have to read hymns out of a book. I'm going to have to stand and sit a million times. And I went to his youth group and found out that's not what it was like at all. Um, our youth was, was awesome. We had, we had the entire area was like set up for teens. They had a, a, a room that was just for, for pool with the pool table. They had a room that had a giant screen TV that we played Guitar Hero and uh, Dance Dance Revolution, if you are young enough to know what that is. Um, there was an entire room that was nothing but video games. And, like, they lined the walls. And then outside we'd go, and they, we had a skate park. And it was, it was fun. It was really, really cool. As an eighth grader, I went and said, church is awesome because it has all of this stuff. And looking back on it, I'm like, I got a chance to hang out with my friends. I got a chance to, I got a chance to play games. I got a chance to have fun on a weeknight, which wasn't allowed because we have school the next day. So you just don't do that, except it was church. And so my parents were like, okay, you can do that. Later down the, my life, I started thinking about it, realizing none of that stuff would have been there if there wasn't a church behind that ministry, behind the generation, believing in them. So 
all of this to say is, is, is if it wasn't for givers that I never met, I wouldn't be here today. There were people giving to this church, and it wasn't like, it wasn't like they just gave to the youth ministry. I'm not here to, to take an offering for the youth ministry. I'm here to say, like, the church was behind the next generation. The church was behind my generation. And because of the input and influence they had in just their giving, my life was changed. So when you give on a Sunday morning, when you give online throughout the week, whenever you give, whenever you get your paycheck and it goes auto-drafted, our intent, our purpose, the plan of what we receive is to change lives, to impact generations, to move this community from where it is to where God wants it to be. That's what our giving is about. That's why why we take this time out every single week. That's why we make it a priority in our teenagers' lives to teach them how to give. So this morning, I want to challenge you with your giving. Give not just to do it again, but give to change somebody's life. Like like my life was changed. And I'd, I'd venture to bet somebody's giving that you've never met has changed your life. So let's pray. Father, this morning, we're not just tapping in our card number on our phone or dropping a check in a bucket. But God, we are giving to change lives. God, that's that's the heart behind this church, that we would see lives changed, we would see Jesus made famous, and we would see everything better for you. God, thank you for my upbringing that taught me how to give, that showed me what a giving church looks like. I pray that, that we will hear from you and give like you give. We love you. Bless this offering. Bless your givers. We thank you. We pray all this in Jesus name. And everyone said, amen. 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 Well, good morning, Harvest. How are you today? Let's give a big welcome to uh, Harvest Cuesta via live feed this morning. Give them a hand this morning. Super excited for them and all God's doing in the community of Cuesta. Um, real quick, I want to do two things before we get into today's message. We've already announced that our trunk or treat is coming up in just a couple of weeks. And uh, just I realized this week we were talking in staff meeting that one of my um, very important roles is to help you to connect the why, the whys behind the what's. And in this case, the what is a trunk or treat. It's games and candy and a uh, Ninja Warrior course. Did, did you hear that? There's Ninja Warrior course this year and uh, all kinds of fun stuff. And, and I know for some, and a lot of you, you've been around long enough, you, you get this, you know our culture a little bit, but like, why is this important? Why would we, you know, invest in this? And, you know, is our mission just to hop kids up on sugar or, you know, what, what's going on? And, and, and so I want you to hear my heart in this. This is a long-term investment into our community. Year after year, we're going outside. And here's what we're saying in this is we're saying, hey, we're here to stay. We're here to love. We're here to serve. We're, we're, we're not asking anything from you, but instead we're giving something to you. And, and here's the reality is that just year after year, just showing up and being there and being involved in our community is I know this is that at some point, some family is going to have a crisis and they'll know who to turn to. They'll know that we're here, that we care, that we love. And so I I hope you'll help us this year. I talked to a few people this week that are um, already working on their their costumes and they're already working on their car decorations. And uh, I'm trying to convince Mitch this morning we were talking. I'm trying to convince him to bring his chickens um, to the trunk or treat just because I think that would be cool. And uh, I don't, we were trying to figure out how to work it in to his truck. And I don't we don't know yet, but um, chickens would be awesome. And so uh, I hope you'll I hope you'll do that. I hope you'll be a part. Second thing, um, we're in the, a season right now called 40 Days for Life. We set 40 days aside. This is nationwide. We, we just jumped on board of this train. Um, but for 40 days, we are committing to praying for life in our city, in our state, in our country. And um, and so I, I hope you're, you've added this to your normal prayer time. But each Sunday during this, I've asked you to join me in praying. And, and here's one of my prayers. We are in 
in what I'm simply calling um, the season of election chaos, all right? So whatever you believe or don't believe or like or don't like or party or not party, I don't care, all right? Here's what I know. Scriptures teach us clearly that no one is put into authority that God doesn't put there. Does anyone believe that? And so that's the only reason, the single only reason that I'm not afraid going into this November is that I know that God is in charge. And so one of my prayers during 40 days of life is God in all of this election chaos, will you uh, somehow put the right people in the right positions in the right places to affect change for life locally um, here in our city, in our state, and yes, in our nation as well. And I think God can do that. Do you believe he can do that? And so we're praying for life. And I just want you to join me this morning. Let's take 60 seconds. Let's pray for life and ask God to do something miraculous across our our nation. Let's pray. Lord, we pray for life this morning. God, we join with thousands across our nation who have committed during this 40 days to pray for life. Lord, we pray, God, that your will would be done. God, here in Albuquerque, in New Mexico, and across our nation. God, this morning it would be easy to get to get fearful and worried and 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 and, and just get all worked up, Lord, if we're what paying too much attention to the media and what's going on. But Lord, this morning, part of our prayer is this. We put our hope and our trust in you. God, we ask that you would work all things, God, for life here in our city, in our state, and our nation. God, we ask you to work those things out. Put the right people in the right places. God, we pray for favor, Lord, for the organizations that are fighting day in and day out for life. We pray for families who are having to make difficult decisions. We ask for the right resources and the right people, the, the, the right uh, support system there. And Lord, we just are asking and believing that you'll protect the unborn. Lord, that you would you would enact in life, God, across this nation. And we pray for that today in the name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Well, we are in a series right now called Winning at the Game of Life. Winning at the Game of Life. And, and the idea of this series is simply this, is we're hoping to equip you with both the biblical truth as well as the practical tools to be able to win in life. Does anyone like winning this morning? Anyone? All right. I like winning. In fact, a little too much. And you, you probably know that about me already. But here, here's the idea is, is, you know, losing a board game and losing in life are very, very different. The consequences are very, very different. We can't afford to lose in life. We can't afford to lose in our marriages. We can't afford to lose in our parenting. We cannot afford to lose in what God has called us to be, right? Amen? And so the, the series, this is really about how to win in life. And uh, you can't talk about winning in life and not talk about how to win with your finances. And so last week, we started a discussion about our finances. We used the game of mousetrap to talk about the debt trap and how to how to stay out of debt, how to get out of debt, how to, you know, how to do that. And I have to, I have to issue an apology because, you know, I, I was just kind of having fun. I had the, the blender up here and, you know, I offered to blend your credit cards up and, and, and we still will do that. I, I would love to help blend your, your credit cards up, but I was just kind of joking around. I, I teasingly said that I raided my staff, um, their wallets this week and I, I called out some names and, and um, and, and, uh, the, I, I apologize because um, I just threw people under the bus and they don't even have the debt that I was just making fun. I was teasing and so I, I hope you'll forgive me for that. Um, and I called Sarah out and Natalie out and you know, I think I have like their Hastings card. It's, it's not even, I was, I was just teasing, right? All right, so so there we go. You've forgiven me. They've forgiven me. Uh, but here's the deal. We're trying to figure out how to win in our finances. So see if in, if your mom or dad ever said something like this to you. I would, I would go and I would, my dad really was the one that said this. I would go and I would ask for something, you know, can I have this? Can I go to this? Can we, can we do this? And my dad would often say to me, he'd say, son, do you think money grows on trees? 
Anyone, anyone's parent ever said that to, to you? Do you think money grows on trees? To which I would respond by running out into our backyard to try to find the money tree, right? Like, like in my mind, he was saying, like, if we, if we can find the money on the trees, then you can go do this. So I'm gonna do it. I'm like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go. It, by the way, if you ever find a money tree, just bring me like a, a little, a seed from it. We'll plant a whole bunch of them around this campus and at my house and your house and, and, but, but here's the reality is that that statement identifies uh, kind of how we tend to think about money. See, we, we tend to think that the problem with money is the lack of it. That the problem is the fact that we don't have enough. That there's not a money tree that we can just go, you know, as the bills are coming in, we can just go pluck a few more dollars off and pay the bills or take care of this, send the kid to camp, whatever it happens to be. We, we tend to think that the the problem is that, that we don't have enough. But I, I think, and, and I think you'll, you'll agree with me as we unpack this today, that that's not the issue at all. As we look at what Jesus teaches about how to win with our finances, we're going to discover that that is really not, really not the idea. Now last week I cast some, some vision for what I would want what I pray for, what I desire for you, for your family, and for your finances. And quite honestly, it was so much fun to, to be able to pray this over you and dream this and cast this vision that I was like, man, I'm going to do this again. Because often the church, the church gets a bad rap when it comes to money. Often people are like, you know, all oh, that's all that church talks about. That's all that pastor talks about. All they, they take up 14 offerings every Sunday. That's all they want is our money. And I, I just want you to hear me loud and clear this morning. I don't want something from you, but rather I want something for you. You see, Jesus said this in John 10, 10. He said, the thief comes to steal, kill, and to destroy, but I have come that you may have life and life to the full. And I think that identifies this idea that I want something for you. I want you to have the life that Jesus Christ intended for you. And when it comes to your finances, here's what I think it would look like, is I want you to be debt-free. I want you to be able to have the finances to to do the things that God has called you to do. I want you to be able to pay cash for vacations. I want you to be able to save up for retirement. I want you to be able to save for your kids' weddings. I want you to be able to have an emergency fund. I want you I want you to enjoy life. I don't want you to be stressed out and wondering how you're going to fill up the gas tank or pay the power bill or take care of the mortgage. But I want you to have that kind of a life, a John 10, 10 life, a life to the full. Really what I want is this. I want you to be able to live generously. And we can't live generously if we're encumbered by debt. If, In other words, if we're losing in our finances, it's going to cause, there's a cause and effect that we're not going to be winning overall in our lives as well. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 21, he said this, he said, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. See, Jesus identified here the real issue. The issue is not a lack of money. The issue is not uh, that we don't have money trees. It's not our bank account or our 401k. It's not our budget or our credit cards. It's not how much or how little we have. What Jesus says is that our treasure, in other words, the thing that we, that we esteem, that we put up on that pedestal, that we value, that thing that we treasure reveals the affection of our heart. So, so the heart of a, of a discussion about money or stuff or possessions, the, at the heart of that discussion, it's really a discussion about the condition of our hearts. You see, today it's, it, the, today's talk is not even about money. It's really about our hearts. It's about where are our hearts? What, what's the affection of our hearts? What are the things that we treasure? What are the things that, that our hearts are longing for? And, and at least for me, this is true. For some of you, it will be as well is very few things in life reveal the, the condition of my heart like a board game. Anyone with me on this? 
Like, my wife seems to believe that people actually play board games for fun. Can you believe that? Like, she'll be like, oh, family night, let's play a game for fun. And I'm like, you don't get it. It's not fun unless I win. Like, like I don't play games for fun. I play games to win. Anyone with me on that? We'll pray for you later. Okay. <laughs> See, but, but here's the reality is, is when I play a game, it reveals some things about my heart. It reveals some selfishness. It, it reveals maybe some pride. It, it reveals some things in my heart. And, and, and one of the games that really gets me is the game of Monopoly. Does anyone like, anyone like this game? The game of Monopoly? So anyone not like this game? It's okay to not like this game. All right. So, so according to the Google, okay, this is the number one board game of all time. All right. Over a billion people have played this game worldwide. Isn't that crazy? Over a billion people. And I like this game. It, it's fun, all right? But I, I have an issue with this game. And I don't know if you know this, but, you know, the, the game has, it has different little game pieces, right? Like the top hat and the dog and the, the car and, you know, the iron and, and all the little game pieces. Does anyone have a favorite Monopoly game piece? Anyone? So here, here's what I want you to do. On the count of three, you're just going to shout out for me your favorite Monopoly game piece. Okay? So think about it for a second. If you don't know, then I give you permission just to make one up and you can shout that because I don't want you to feel left out this morning because everyone matters. Okay? So I want you to feel loved this morning. So count of three, give me your favorite Monopoly game piece. One, two, three. Thimble, hat, Shoe. Okay, here we go. So here's my issue with Monopoly. All right, here's my issue. Is in 2013, they retired one of the game pieces. All right, they did this whole nationwide thing and they, they, uh, voted and they retired the iron. Okay, the little iron. That's not my issue. I don't care anything about the iron. My issue is they replaced it, people, with a cat. For crying out loud, a cat. Like, they ruined the game right then and there, right? Like, who wants to play a game with a cat? I mean, I'm, let's just be honest. That's ridiculous, all right? We're going to pray for you uh, cat lovers later as well. And they, re- they replaced it with a cat. And so I am thankful this morning because I have a vintage pre-2013 non-cat monopoly, okay? Cat-free monopoly. Praise the Lord. So be careful, friends. If you need a game of Monopoly, make sure you buy one before 13, all right? You do not want one with a cat. And so I, I, um, I decided last October, I decided to teach my girls how to play Monopoly. So we have three, 12, 8, and 7. And so last October, we decided to play a rousing game of Monopoly. Before you judge me, some of you are already there. You're already judging me as a bad parent, Okay. I felt this was my fatherly duty to teach my children real life lessons, okay? See, this is where for me, games are not just games, all right? They're very real to me. And so some of you softies would have let your kids win, all right? But this is not the YMCA, all right? This is real life. Everyone doesn't get a trophy in real life. And so we played Real Monopoly. And um, they say a picture is worth a thousand words. So there's the picture. And this is not staged. Like, I promise you... Um, in fact, I have a video and I, and I reviewed it this week and I, I determined that it would just not be proper for me to play this video for you this morning because it's a video of my youngest daughter breaking down and bawling crying because I was taking her money and her property, okay? And, and, and I know some of you are like, you are so mean. I would do it to you just the same, all right? I would treat, I'm an equal opportunist when it comes to games. Because here, here's the deal. If you don't know how Monopoly works, the, the game of Monopoly is this. Is you gather as much money and as many properties, and you build as many houses and as many hotels as you can with the intent of bankrupting your enemies. I mean, I mean your uh, opponents, right? Your, uh, your friends, your children, right? 
I mean, that's the game. Like, what an awesome game, right? A massive fortune and bankrupt everyone else, right? And so, so this is how the game wins. But, but, but let's think about it. Let's think about it. Is that not what culture is teaching us today about our, our, our stuff, our finances, our wealth? Is, you know, the, 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 the slogan of, of today would be this. He or she who dies with the most stuff wins. Like, like the way you win, this is what culture teaches, not Jesus, not the Bible. What culture teaches about wealth is this, is that you win by having the most. You win by having more. You win by building a big house, by buying the nice car, by wearing the right brands, by going to the right places, by taking the right trips, by posting the right pictures, right? That's what culture teaches us. And, and that's really the game of Monopoly is gather as much as you can, you know, take as much as you can, um, hold it as tightly as you can to yourself, right? Like, like the image for me would be the image of of tight fists is i'm gonna gather i'm gonna hold it all i'm not gonna i'm not gonna share right like when i was playing with my daughters you know when one of them um, got into a financial crunch i could have used some of my monopoly wealth to bail them out right i could have been oh eden i'm not gonna take your property here's five hundred dollars or i'm not gonna charge you rent because we're related no no, right? Like I'm going to teach her that this, this is that this is how you win in real life. You got to pay your bills. You got to have a budget. You got to take care of stuff. And, and the idea of monopoly is we, we we hold it. We we keep it tight to us. We don't share. We just we amass this wealth. In fact, the definition of of monopoly, the word monopoly, is exclusive possession and total control. Exclusive possession and total control. See, that's, that, that's how society would teach us that we win with our money is you've got to have possession and control of a lot of stuff. But I think that we have it backwards. If we look at, at Jesus and how he lived his life, and if we look at the things that he teaches us, this, this is why it's really a, a heart issue is that what Jesus teaches he actually wants a monopoly from us. He wants a monopoly on our hearts. You see, what Jesus wants is he wants exclusive possession and total control of our heart. That's why this actually isn't a discussion about money. <laughs> is that what Jesus is after is he's after our hearts. He wants complete control and possession of our hearts. And we see an account in the Gospel of Mark where this really plays out. And, and I wanted you to see it this morning. There, there, there's a, a, an account in, in, in the Gospel there where a rich young ruler is what in most of your Bibles, it, it, there would be the, the, the heading over this passage. There's a, there's a wealthy young man, in other words, that comes to Jesus and, and he runs to him and he, he poses this question. He says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And see, this question, this identifies an issue. See, the issue is this. He's beginning to figure out that no matter how much stuff I amass here and now on this earth, there's something coming after this, this thing called eternal life. And, 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 and so the, the reality is he's beginning to figure out that my years here on earth, however many there are, they're limited. And, and I want to live here and now in such a way that I also get to enjoy the later, the, the eternal, right? I mean, think about the, the 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 years here on earth, right? Like we want to enjoy them. But the reality is what we want to do is we want to live it the right way here so that we can enjoy it later. And this rich young guy who's got a bunch of stuff, and you'll, you'll see that as we read it, he's beginning to ask this question. What do I do to, to get eternal life? How do I make sure that I get to enjoy that life? 
I remember as a, as a young boy, I, I grew up in a pastor's home. And, and, and so um, I remember early on, I remember there was a, 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 a woman in our, in our church that had passed away. And, uh, and my, my parents were, were, you know, doing the funeral. And so we, we just happened to be there because that's what pastor's kids do is we're, we're just at the church all the time. And so, and I remember, because I remember this woman and I, and we, I liked her. We had, we had good, always had good conversation. She was nice to us. And we shared, um, a, a like of two things. We both liked Dr. Pepper and we both liked M&Ms. Okay. And, and because, and she would often, she would have a bag of M&Ms. M&M's in her purse and she would share with me at church and so so we got to be friends and this woman passed away and, and I remember because they they did an open casket and, and I came by to to see her and this was like my first time that I really remember you know this experience I'm looking in the casket I'm peering over and somebody had placed inside the casket with her a can of Dr. Pepper and a bag of M&Ms. And I almost took it from her. Because even as a young man, here's what I knew. She's not going to get to enjoy that. She's gone. <laughs> like that, that snack is over for her, right? Like here's what I, I remember as a young boy realizing we don't get to take it with us. The stuff that we have here on earth the stuff we amass, the stuff that we collect, we don't get to take it with us. And this, this rich young ruler, he's figuring this out, and he comes to Jesus and he says, what do I do to inherit eternal life? And in verse 19, Jesus responds to him and he says this, he says, you know the commandments, and here he's speaking specifically of the famous Ten Commandments, and then he says this, he, he, he points out, he says, you know the commandments. He says, you shall not murder, you shall not, shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, don't give false testimony, don't defraud, and honor your father and mother. So let me make an observation here. There are ten commandments, and, and they're actually broken into two categories. I don't know if you've ever noticed this or paid attention, but the first four commandments actually have to do with how we interact with God. They're, they're, they're vertical in nature. They're about how our hearts interact with the heart of God. And then the other six commandments, the, the six that Jesus is pointing out to the rich young, young ruler, have to do with how we interact horizontally with our, our fellow man, with, with our neighbor, with our friend. And so Jesus here, he very he, he very specifically leaves out the four about how we, how we interact with God. And he points out the six that have to do with how we interact with our neighbor. Okay. This is his response to the man's question. And what I want you to see here is what, what Jesus was doing is he was setting this guy up. He, he was, he, he had baited the hook and he threw that slat line out there and this sucker took the bait. All right. You'll see it here because he, he see, he hears these six commandments, right? And, and in verse 20, the man says this. He says, teacher, all these things I have kept, all these commandments I have kept since I was a boy. In other words, he's saying, this is great news. I am a good person, right? I treat other people fairly. I'm nice. I'm kind. I'm not an adulterer. I'm not a liar. I'm not a thief. I've honored my parents, right? Like, in other words, here, here's the reality is he's, he's judging his goodness based on his ability to interact with fellow man, right? What he didn't see is that God, had, had Jesus had set him up because he'd left out those other four commands conveniently, right? And so the guy's getting excited and he's thinking, I have a chance. Remember his question, how do I have eternal life? Well, he's realizing maybe I have a chance. And then Jesus, he, he kind of gives him the uppercut here because he, he, he answers his question. But, but I want you to see how he answers his question. Verse 21 says that Jesus looked at him and loved him. And, and I'll just pause right there because this is important. This is one of those verses that, that you might just read quickly over and not pay any attention to. But, but we see this all throughout the scripture and we see it here. 
everything that Jesus says or does to you and I is out of a heart of love. I want you to know this this morning. See, some of you may be here today and, and your picture of God is, is not a picture of a loving father, but maybe it's a, a picture, you know, of God's kind of standing on the edge of heaven, looking down on earth with a lightning bolt in his hand, just waiting for you to mess up so he can just zap you, right? Like some of us, that, that's the problem is, is we have this view of God that it's not based out of love, it's based out of rules, it's based out of judgment it's based out of fear it's based out of all these other things and i read this verse this week and it just it just kind of slapped me upside the head jesus looked at him and loved him and i want you to hear this morning if you don't hear anything else that jesus loves you that everything in everything in your life every interaction he has with you every thought he has towards you everything is based out of this heart of love and Jesus looks at him and he loves him and he says this, one thing you lack, one thing you lack. And I just have to believe that this guy who, he's a good guy, he's, he's, been, he's been moral, he's, he's made some pretty good decisions, he's amassed a wealth. He, he's probably thinking at this point, okay, just one thing, tell me what it is. I can do it, I can do it. I've kept all these other commands since I was a boy. I, I've been, I've done good. Tell me the one thing and I'll do it. And Jesus says, okay, here it is. Go, sell everything you have, give it to the poor. Then you'll have treasure in heaven and then come and follow me. And it's so sad what we see next because it says at this, the man's face fell and he went away sad because he had great wealth. In other words, this was going to cost him an exorbitant amount. And Jesus looked around and then he sees his disciples and he says to them how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. You see, this passage is, is both um, amazing and enlightening at the same time. This guy was a stand-up guy. He kept most of the commands for most of his life. And, and, and so I'm reading this week, and, and here's what I'm thinking. So why was this so difficult? Why was it so hard for this guy who was, who was good, right? Who, who honored his parents and he didn't lie and he didn't steal and he, 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 he lived a good, why was this one thing so difficult for him? Well, we have to remember that our heart follows our treasure. <laughs> And we see here that this guy had a lot of treasure, right? He had a lot of stuff that he had amassed through his own personal game of Monopoly. He had, he had made some good business deals and he tucked it away and he bought some property and he built a, an inn on the property and he rented those rooms out and he made a little bit more and he tucked that away. And, 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 and so he had made, he, he had built this, this, this kingdom for himself. He had amassed a lot of stuff. And, and here's the, here's the deal. It's not about the stuff. It's about our hearts and our hearts follow what we treasure <laughs> and see here's here's the the misnomer you don't have to have a lot of stuff to treasure it <laughs> you don't have to have a big bank account or a big house or a fancy car for your heart to be affectionate towards something you know, one of the things I've noticed, I, I've had the privilege of being able to travel a lot into different countries and third world places. And, and here's, and honestly, this is true here with our, our poor, but, and it's true abroad as well, is, is I will find someone who literally has nothing. Like, like in India recently, I saw people who, who they, they were squatters. They literally found a piece of the sidewalk and said, this is going to be my house. And and when no one was around, they quickly put up a tarp and they made it their house. And the law there is, is that's, you can't kick them off now. And so they literally live under a tarp on the sidewalk. But you know what they have? An iPhone. Isn't that crazy? And I'm not judging that. Here's what I'm telling you is you don't have to have a lot to have something that you treasure. And you know what else? You may not treasure, it may not be stuff. 
Maybe it's a person. Maybe it's a talent. Maybe, you see what I'm saying? The reality is our hearts follow our treasure. And so when Jesus asked the man, hey, sell all your stuff, give it to the poor, come follow me, it wasn't about the stuff. He was actually doing a heart test. He was saying, where is your heart? Because what I want is I want your heart. I want a monopoly on your heart. I want complete control. I want exclusive possession. You see, some people would read this passage and, and they'd, they'd find a fence at it and, and they'd go, see, see, this is all the church ever talks about. It's just the money. All they want is my money. They take 14 offerings every Sunday. All they talk, God, all God talked about is the money. All pastors today talk about is the money. That's all they want is the money. But, but you would be wrong. This passage is not about the money. It's about our hearts. But while we're on that topic, let's think about it this morning. Let me ask you a question. Do you really think that your bank account will change the financial future for God? <laughs> Like, think about it, right? Like, it always amazes me when someone says, well, all they want is my money. All that pastor, all that church, all they want is my money. And I'm like, seriously, the God of the universe, the God who created it all, the God who gave all of that to you, the God who owns it all, do you think he really cares about your bank account? Do you think he's, you know, is he, is he wondering, you know, am I going to be able to afford, you know, world domination? Oh man, I better get that guy's bank account in order to do the things that I've been dreaming about doing. God, here's what I'm saying. God doesn't need our money. He wants our hearts. But the reality is our hearts are naturally attracted to the thing that we treasure. I recently heard someone say this. I think, think it's so good. It's worth saying to you this morning. They said, they said, giving is not about getting something out of our pockets, but about getting something out of our hearts. See, the reality is that when we give, we break the greed that rules over this world. When we give, we break the selfishness that rules in our hearts. When we, when we give, we're, it's not about getting something out of our pockets, but rather it's about getting something out of our hearts. And so what happens in this story is the rich young ruler decides. He, he asks the question. Jesus answers the question. And in that moment, the rich young ruler decides, I'm content with giving you most of my life, but I'm going to go ahead and retain control of this one area. You know, in all reality, you know, there, the guy was really good with his money. <laughs> he had he had done well. He'd made wise investments. He'd built up a good bank account. He, he was good with it. And, and, and that's sometimes the trick of the enemy. You don't have to give control of that because you're doing such a good job with it already. <laughs> And this is what the, the rich young ruler did is he looked at it and he said, God, I'll give you all the other areas of my life, but I think I'll go ahead and I'll re retain control of this one area. And friends, let me just tell you that that is a recipe for disaster. The, the, the things that, in fact, the things that we try so hard to control, those are the things that we will lose control of. The things we try so hard to hold on to, they tend to slip right through our fingers. You know, the things that we try so hard to, to maintain and to, to control, the, those are the things that will get us into trouble. It's that, it's that one area that we won't give God a monopoly over. You see, it's easy for us to, 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 to cast at someone and here would be a scenario we we look at someone that faithfully attends church sunday after sunday after sunday and we see them and they serve and they give and they're they're involved and they do that and then all of a sudden that person they 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 have some kind of a misstep they stumble they 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 sin there's something that happens there and, and it would be really really easy really convenient for us to look at church every week they were they were there all the time they were faithful they were involved how can they live this way on sundays but this way 
during the week? And the answer is simple. The answer is this. It's a heart issue. The answer is there was a part of that heart that was not completely given over to the Lord. There was a part of that heart where, where someone said, I am going to maintain control. I'm going to maintain possession. I'm going to manage this part of my life. And God, I'll give you every other part of my life. Friends, hear me. If you, if you maintain control of an area of your life, then God doesn't have a monopoly. <laughs> The idea of monopoly is complete control, complete possession. So if he has 99.9% of your heart, that is not a monopoly. He he does not have all of your heart. And I'm telling you, that 0.1% will get you into trouble. The the, the scriptures are clear that our hearts are deceitful. Our hearts, our our hearts are broken from the very beginning. Like, like I've, I've said this before, but look, look at a child. You don't have to teach a child how to be bad. You teach them how to be good, right? Like from the very beginning, they are bent towards going the other way. There, there, there's just something in it. It's called human nature, right? We are human and we tend to go that direction and that's why it's so important that we give God all of our lives. Remember the image of the the tight fist. We hold on to things hoping they'll make us happy, hoping that they will satisfy. Ecclesiastes 5.10 says, whoever loves money will never have enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. See, this is the idea of the world, right? I just need that raise. I just need a little more. Pastor, if I just had 500 more a month, we could do it. Pastor, if I just had this, we'd be able to afford to tithe. Pastor, if I just had, it's just, it's always, here's the reality, is if if the thing you treasure is stuff, You'll never have enough. That's why Jesus teaches in Matthew 6, 19. Don't store up for yourselves treasures here on earth. You see, think about it for just a moment this morning. Today's treasures will be tomorrow's landfill. I think about it. That thing that you so desperately want, that thing that you think you can't live without, it will eventually end up in a landfill. I'll never forget my grandfather passed away several years ago. He lived in Oklahoma and, and, and all of our family, we all lived in other states. And so we came together for the funeral and we decided it was easiest since we were all from away to spend a few extra days and to go through his belongings and, you know, divvy up and clean up the house and get his affairs in order so that, you know, so that, so that we could all kind of close that chapter. And it was just easier because we were all there. So we started going through the house and, you know, event, you know, we'd find something. I, I, I have my, one of my grandfather's Bibles. I said, man, I want, I want this. And another, you know, cousin wanted that. And we, we figured out, but, but often <laughs> we found things that was like, this is of no value to anyone. I mean, just like we don't, nobody needs this, right? So we started piling up all this stuff that no longer had a value to anyone. And, and then we realized like, that's a lot of stuff. And none of us wanted to make trip after trip to a landfill. So luckily he lives in the country. We'd we'd get in big trouble for this in Albuquerque. But he lives in the country. And so one of us had the bright idea, let's start a bonfire. And so um, right in front of my grandfather's house, we started a bonfire. And we found like boxes and boxes of old, you know, like tax returns from like 40 years back, right? Like now he's dead. Nobody needs this, right? Like if the IRS wants to audit it, good luck now, right? And so we started throwing like boxes of stuff in and broken furniture and, you know, all just stuff that it had no value. And, and so for two days, we just, I mean, just nonstop, we just burned stuff. I mean, just throwing it. And of course, we, you know, we Dickinson men, we love fire. And so we were just finding stuff to burn and oh, just burn and burn and stuff. And, and, and something happened for me because we were getting ready to leave and we were done. The house was cleared. We all had the stuff that, that had value to us. And as we're leaving, there was a, a pile of ashes and there was just a little bit of, of smoke. Still, and the fire was dead. It was just smoldering, a little bit of smoke. And I looked at that and, and I had this thought. I thought, you know what? 
My, everything that my grandfather amassed here on earth is now reduced to a pile of ashes. And then I thought, one day, my children and my grandchildren will burn all of my stuff too. And that was just depressing. I mean, I'm like, why am I doing this? Why am I collecting stuff? Why? You're like, like, I promise you, if I died today, my wife would be like, who in their right mind needs this many saws? Right? And like, who needs this many guns? Why did, why did Jason collect this? And some of you would have to help her. You'd have to counsel her and you'd have to, well, this is why you needed all of this. And, you know, and you'd have, but, but here's the reality, right? Today's treasures, the stuff that you're collecting and amassing and the stuff that's honestly so dear to our hearts right now will one day be in a landfill. It'll one day be garbage. It'll one, one day someone's going to look at it and go, why in the world did they keep this? Why did they work so hard to buy that? You see, it's not about stuff. It's really about our, it's really about our hearts. You see, there's a, there's a, a word that the scripture uses that, that really helps us to, to better understand how we should view stuff possessions. And here's what it is. It's a word called stewardship. Stewardship. This is a word that's used throughout the Bible. And if, if, if the idea of monopoly is tight fisted, grab a hold of it, hold on to as much as you can, the idea of stewardship is quite the opposite. The idea of stewardship is living with hands wide open. Living with hands wide open. You see, a steward realizes that they're not the owner, but they've simply been trusted to manage someone else's stuff for a period of time. And when it comes to stuff here on earth, God is the owner and we are the stewards. We are the ones that have been trusted to manage stuff here on earth. So let me give you three really quick thoughts on stewardship. Number one, everything comes from God. Stewardship principle number one is that we have to realize that everything belongs to God. Like I want you to think about it. Every single thing that is in your name right now, everything you own, everything in your house, in your car, in your purse, on your, everything belongs to God. Everything comes from God. He owns it all. James 1.7 says, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights. So its stewardship starts with realizing who the rightful owner is. See, when we think we own something, we tend to hold so much tightly to it we can't let it go we can't let it get broken or hurt or misplaced we we have to hold on to it but the reality of stewardship is that we don't own anything because god owns it all number two stewards must be faithful first corinthians 4 2 teaches now it's required that those who've been given a trust must prove faithful Maybe I should say it this way. Good stewardship is faithful stewardship. You see, there's, there's accounts in the Bible. We won't look at them today, but there's accounts in the Bible that show wise stewardship and unwise stewardship. And, and what we are called to as followers of Christ is to be faithful stewards. The principle is simple. It's this, is that if you are faithful with little, then you'll be entrusted with more. If you're faithful with that, you'll be entrusted with more. If you're faithful with that, you'll be entrusted with more. And we're not just talking about stuff here, but stuff is in the equation. And so I would encourage you that if you're, if you're one that you look and you say, you know, <clears throat> I never seem to have enough. I never seem, why does everyone else have the opportunities? Why does everyone else around me seem to, to get the open doors? I would say this, I would say, look at yourself first, <laughs> Have you been faithful in the little? Have you been faithful with what he's already entrusted you with? And if you're sitting there going, well, he's never trusted me with anything, then you have not yet acknowledged that it all comes from him in the first place. Good stewardship 
is faithful stewardship. And number three, wise stewardship is always rewarded. If I could have the worship team join me this morning. Wise stewardship is always rewarded. Luke 16, 11, If you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? See, here, here's the reality. is We as followers of Christ, simultaneously we operate in the seen and the unseen. We're simultaneously operating here on earth, but the actions here on earth have eternal consequences. We're, we're, we're operating in both spheres at the same time. And here's what I want you to hear is that your stuff and how you handle your stuff is not actually about your stuff. It's all a test. <laughs> How you handle your stuff, how you handle your, your finances, how you manage what God is entrusting you with. It's really all a test for Him to see if He can trust you with what really matters. See, it's that whole thing of seen and unseen. While I was in Calcutta a couple of weeks ago, I had the incredible honor to visit Mother Teresa's um, uh, the convent where she she worked out of for 47 years, the last 47 years of her life. And honestly, I didn't I didn't know we were going to get to see this, and it wasn't even on my radar. And and one day they say, hey, we're going to go see Mother Teresa's place, and I'm like, oh man, this is this is so cool, this is incredible. And and uh, Mother Teresa, she died in in 1997, and I was a, a senior in high school at that point. And I remember remember hearing about, I remember reading about her life, and, and and here's the reality is that is that she affected change on a worldwide scale. I mean, she she really did. And so here I am, I'm on the bus, we're headed to go see her house, and I'm imagining, you know, all these things that it could be, and like, I'm going, man, this world changer, like, how did she do it? Where did she do it from? Where, where's her bat cave, and what did it look like? Oh my goodness, I can't, ah, I just can't, this is going to be amazing. And we get there, and we come in, and there's a single set of stairs that goes up to this room, and I, I have a picture of it for you. Because it's, it's just, it's underwhelming, honestly. Like most of you have a closet in your home bigger than the room that she lived in for 47 years. <clears throat> it was right above the kitchen, so it was the hottest room in the whole convent. And they said, a little plaque there tells a story, it said she never allowed a fan even to be put into her room, even though it was the hottest room in the place. It has a little bed, a little table, a little desk, a shelf on the wall. And I'm looking in this room and I'm like, I just guess I expected more. <laughs> like how did, how did she change the world from a closet, right? Like don't you need more stuff to change the world? You know, don't you need like the high tech, most awesome, best, you know, stuff to change the world? And, and I just, I was looking at it and I realized it's not about stuff, right? Like here, here's what I realized is she was a steward. Early on, she, she decided, she said, I'm going to live a life open arms, open handed. God, whatever you, I'll just be a, a, a pass through, a siphon. Like whatever you want to give me, I'll just give it away. I'll just, I'll just help others. I'll just give it away. And, and, and then I, I went from that room and I went down. They had a little kind of walk through, you could museum kind of thing. You could see pictures and a little items and different things. And you know what's sitting there like unguarded, unprotected, just, just sitting there is her Nobel Peace Prize. And I'm like, what in the world? Like if I had a Nobel Peace Prize, like I would have that thing under lock and key. I mean, I'd have guards. Like I would be like, that would be a prized possession. Like, and you know what I realized in that moment? Our hearts follow our treasure, right? And I realized, I'm like, she didn't treasure the Nobel Peace Prize and all that came with that she threw it on a shelf and she kept on going. She kept loving people. She kept serving people. And she kept being a steward of everything that God was giving to her. It was an, it was an amazing moment. 
So here, here's the question for you and I today. Here's, the, here's what we have to contemplate. What part of my life have I not surrendered to the Lord? You see, if we're, if we're honest, most of us have a hard time giving God a monopoly of some part of our lives. So you might be able to pat yourself on the back and you know, maybe it's not possessions today. Maybe it's not money. Maybe, maybe it's your schedule. Maybe it's, maybe it's your time. Maybe it's a specific relationship. Maybe it's the desire for a specific relationship. Maybe it's that one habit, that one struggle, that one addiction that you just haven't been able to give up because it feels so good. It's, it's, so, it's so comforting. It helps you. The reality is we, a lot of us, you know, salvation is both a moment and a process, right? Like we're, we're saved by grace. And then there's this process where he's working things out of us. And here's my question to you today is, what's, what's the thing you've been holding on to? What's the area that you've got the tight fists? Where you have not given up complete control and exclusive possession, See, here, here's what I know this morning is that what God wanted from the rich young ruler and what God wants from you and I today is he wants a monopoly on our hearts. <laughs> he wants us to give, give it all to him. And I'll tell you this from experience is if, if, you hang on to, if you hang on to an area and you think you can manage it yourself, you think you can control it yourself, you think you can do it better or maybe you're afraid to give it up. Whatever, whatever it is, I can tell you, that's the, that's the open door for the enemy to come into your life and to wreak havoc. You see, you see, Jesus, we started here. He didn't want something from you. He wants something for you, right? That, that's, just, that, that's, that's where I got it, right? As a church, that's what, that, that's what I'm saying to you. We don't want something from you. We want something for you. And, and this is what God's saying to you this morning. If you'll give me complete control, I came that you might have life to the full. But I've got to be in control for that to happen. Would you just bow your heads and close your eyes this morning? Let me just ask this question. Do you have an area of your life that you've been hanging on to, that you've been, been maintaining control of, and you'd say this morning, Pastor, I would, I would, I'm ready. I'll give him monopoly on my heart. I'll give up control of this area. And I'm not going to ask you what that area is, but if that's you this morning, heads bowed, eyes closed, would you just raise your hand just right, right where you're at? There's an area of my life that I, I, I need to give, like it's going to destroy me if I don't give control over. I'm just, I'm just going to give it over to him this morning. The whole bunch. So let's do this. Every person in the room, just stand with me right now. And we're going to do this. I didn't prep the worship team, but we're going to sing through, we're going to sing through a chorus of a song, whatever they pick. And here's how we're going to, here's how we're going to end. And then I'm going to pray over you. <clears throat> Some of you early on in our worship time, you, you might've seen people who during their worship, they raised a hand or they raised both hands or how, however they did it. And, and I know for some that that's uncomfortable. That's not how you do it. You're not demonstrative or maybe you grew up in a different, you know, a different way of doing things. But, but here's the reality is raising our hands is a sign of surrender, right? Like, like here on earth, like, you know, if, if you were to be held up by someone and you wanted to assume a posture that was not defensive, but a posture of surrender, like take whatever you want, just I, I give up, you would raise your hands, right? So here's what I want to I want to encourage you is as we sing through this this song, if you'll assume uh, if you're willing, if you'll assume a posture of surrender just by by raising your hands, I want us just to spend a few moments just just surrendering to the Lord and then I'm going to I'm going to pray over you at the end of this. But but this is where the magic happens. Is where you just surrender and you say, God, you can do it better than me. God, I give you control. And, and name that area. God, that I've been holding on to control of this. I've been, I've been trying to trying to stay in charge of this. And you just surrender that thing to him. Let's give him exclusive control and complete possession. Let's worship for just a moment, and then I want to pray over you.
Lord, we surrender, we surrender our hearts to you today, God. We surrender control. God, we surrender possession. We give you every single part of our lives today. I just feel like there may be someone here today that you've never, never given your heart to the Lord. Like a lot of this message has really been aimed towards those of us who have accepted Christ as our Savior, but we've maintained control of a part of our lives. But I just want you to, I want you to know this morning, if you're here today and you've never surrendered your heart to Christ, this would be an amazing day to do that. In fact, I just, I'm just going to, just by faith, I'm going to lead our entire congregation in a prayer of surrender. And if you've never done this to, before, today, you, you can do it right now. There's no hoops to jump through, nothing to sign. You don't got to give blood or drink Kool-Aid. It's literally as easy as crying out to the Lord for a Savior, and He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. Would, would everyone, will you just join me in this prayer this morning? And there may be someone here today that, that you're doing this for the first time, and you're, you're going to surrender your life to Christ. So just repeat this prayer to say, Jesus, I need a Savior. Come and rescue me today. I acknowledge my sin. I can't make it up. Will you forgive me? Will you cleanse me? Will you make my heart new this morning? I surrender my heart to you. I'll follow you for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord, I pray right now for friends who are surrendering for the first time or the thousandth, thousandth time. Lord, we surrender our hearts to you today. God, take control of every area of our lives. And God, I pray, Lord, over those who are giving up control over a specific area. God, I proclaim today, Lord, over that area, Lord, that it would begin to flourish. God, many times we hold on to that area because we're, we're unsure, we're, we're afraid, we're, we're, we're not sure what you'll do with it. We think we'll do it better. And God, I'm just praying, Lord, that as we surrender that place to you, that today, God, you, as you take control, that you would cause it to flourish, to be blessed, to prosper. God, that's, you came to give us life to the full. God, I pray that over my friends today, God, that every single one of us this week would experience that kind of a life. We'd experience it in our marriages, in our families, in our jobs, in our finances, in every part of our lives. God, we thank you, God, that you enable us to win in life. So we put our hope in you, our trust in you, in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. As you're leaving today, may the Lord bless you and keep you, cause his face to shine upon you, give you grace now and forever. Harvest, go be the church this week.